Hello YouTube, I'm Andrew Does Hair. You can find my work on Instagram at Andrew Does Hair. Today I want to do a video talking about kind of the differences theoretically between a cheap haircut and an expensive haircut. Now, I really kind of simplified it into those two different terms because it makes it easier to put it into a title for a video, but really it's like, what can a haircut offer like at the greatest extent of like what the heck can you even get from a haircut versus what is the bare minimum of what a customer would expect from a haircut. Now the purpose of this video is somewhat multifaceted. If you are in fact a haircutter and you're watching this, the only wrong answer as far as everything I'm going to draw out on this little board here behind me is to not consider any of it. If you sit and you think through all of these different points and you, you kind of give yourself an answer for how you like to do things, there's no wrong answer. The only wrong answer is to never think about this stuff. If you are a consumer, um, hopefully, you know, if you've, if you've never gotten like an expensive haircut before or a really nice haircut before and you're wondering what might be missing from what you've been getting, hopefully this video can kind of give you a different perspective on what somebody who really cares a lot about hair is working toward while they cut your hair. See, I've been cutting hair for 16 years. I know a lot of people who cut hair. I know people who do $800 haircuts. I know people who do $8 haircuts. My sort of scene, my community on Instagram is quite large and I, and I interact with a lot of these people often. And so what I'm gonna put together here is pretty much, it's just philosophies and theories. It's like a thesis that I've put together over the years just to take everything that I witness in the scene around me and make it into something digestible for myself to actively try to put into practice in my own business. And I can tell you this, when I started cutting hair and I was charging $20, I didn't do everything I'm gonna talk about here. And you better believe today at $100, I'm actively thinking through everything that I'm talking about here today. So apologies in advance, but this is gonna be somewhat of a long video. It's gonna be a lot of information to cover, but I'm gonna to try to work very quickly. So hopefully I don't miss anything or under explain anything. And uh, more so hopefully I don't over explain anything as I'm doing right now. To begin, this is you. Well, let's say this is you, a barber. This is a barber, he cuts hair. He's got his little scissors, he's got his clippers. And if we look at what a barber can offer, the first thing is skill. This is like the most obvious one. The first thing we offer is skill. And what skill is, is essentially how straight you can cut a line. Somebody who doesn't have a lot of skill would might try to cut a straight line and it doesn't end up very straight. And if you have a lot of skill, you can cut a very straight line. So within our skill, there is cutting skill, as I just explained, and then there might be styling skill. That's kind of really it. Like what we do, technically speaking, is we cut hair, we style hair. And anything beyond that isn't necessarily skill. So if we were to look at pretty much any haircut place ever and just imagine what is the bare minimum that we expect from one of these places. It's we expect at least skill in the cut. We don't even need, need to expect skill in styling. The very least bare minimum thing is we want skill in the haircut. And so in, in so many parts of the barber industry, there's this mindset that here, I'm gonna steal something from Tony Northrup. Go check out his YouTube videos. He's a photography guy. But he, he said something about photography that really like, like punched me in the side of the head. He said in photography, people know the score, but they don't know the rules. Meaning you can look at the photographers who are like doing stuff and shooting celebrities and have a lot of followers. And you, so we can see the score who's doing well, but we don't know the rules about exactly how to get there. And the reason it punched me in the side of the head when I heard that, is I was like, oh my gosh, that's haircutting. There are tons and tons of barbers and stylists out there and, and consumers and just people in general who think that haircutting is like this meritocracy built on the skill in the cut. And that's it. No more, no less. And there should be no more, no less. And this is just incorrect. So we can look at hair cutters and we can see the score. We can see who is charging more. We can see who has more Instagram followers or more likes or who's cutting celebrities or or whatever, whatever metric you might look at to go, oh, this person looks like they're successful at cutting hair. We can see those things. But what we can't agree on is the rules. And so this, moving forward here with every kind of thing I'm gonna talk about, this is just my own theory on the rules, but there really is no solid set of rules. However, what I'm gonna talk about here has definitely helped me in my own career to go from $25 haircuts to $100 haircuts by, by actively trying to pursue these things. So the next thing that we can offer, aside from our skill, is our hospitality. So if skill is how straight can you cut the line, hospitality is how do you treat the customer or the client while you cut that line? And your hospitality starts from the minute somebody tries to book with you. 
If you're hard to book with, that's not very hospitable, is it? If, if it's difficult to book with you and then you're working in a location that's very hard to find, that's the, like right off the bat before they even get in the chair, there's some level of displeasure involved in getting in your chair. And so having nothing at all to do with your haircut and your skill or your styling, if it's hard to book with you or it's hard to find the salon, this is going to detract from your value. But if you have like a great booking system or a great reception staff, that can add to your value. Another thing regarding the hospitality is how you carry yourself, how you're dressed at work. I have to admit, I've been lazy about that in recent years because, well, pandemic and stuff, I'm not gonna put on a suit to go to the salon and, and I'm 20 pounds heavier than I like to be right now, but when I lose the weight, I'll start dressing nicer to work again. But your attire, when the client shows up and you look nice, like you take your job seriously and you want to be there, that definitely adds to their experience and it adds to the value of what you offer. Now, it sounds really silly to say, oh, what, because you wear a tie to work, your haircuts are worth more? No. Because you wear a tie to work, it signals to people that you care about being there and you're happy to see them and you take what you're doing very seriously. And people who want those things in a haircutter, they want a haircutter who just cares the absolute most that they can care. And they're not just like doing the bare minimum of trying to do the best cut they can do, but they're also thinking about the other things. When it's apparent to the customer, if those things matter to them, they're going to like you more than the next barber. Another thing is the music in the salon or barbershop. You know, keep it tasteful, keep it classy, keep it cool. Um, I would have to admit that over the years I've noticed that if I happen to be playing like, I don't know, the Jesus Lizard in my salon when a client comes in and he happens to be a Jesus Lizard fan, you see there's not a lot of sound there, but if a Jesus Lizard fan walks in and he hears me playing the Jesus Lizard, he's like, oh dude, and we're like homies like right away. And, and like 10 out of 10 times, they end up becoming like diehard fan clients. And this is not to say like, hey, try to play the most obscure indie rock music that might attract other people who like that. It's like, just be mindful of the music you're playing and what it's making your clients feel like. If you're playing like gangster rap, expect to get people in there who like gangster rap. You know, if somebody goes in there and gangster rap makes them uncomfortable, they might not come back. And it has nothing to do with how good your cut is. It has everything to do with your hospitality, how you're treating them while you cut the line. But it's something to think about. If you're the type of salon or barbershop to offer your client like a beer or a coffee, that is huge. I would say like the ROI on a cheap six pack of like, well, don't go too cheap because you don't want the clients to, you know, you want, you want them to be, you want them to want the beer. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if, if you go spend 10 bucks on a six pack and like for every day that you go to work, this could in some weird long way linked to all of this eventually lead to your haircuts earning $300 more per day. It could, it is a piece of that puzzle. It doesn't necessarily work like, hey, here's a beer. Now I'm gonna charge you $50 more for this beer. It's more like the clients who appreciate that and look forward to that. It's just another thing on the checklist that they, the check, a subconscious checklist that they don't even know they have to where when they come in, they feel important. They feel accepted. They feel like they're a part of the whole thing happening there. Like getting a haircut at that point is a little bit less of a routine chore and a little bit more of a, a getaway from their routine chores. And something as simple as just offering a beverage can do that. I would say that the decor in your salon or barbershop has a lot to do with this. I've actually been into a barber shop that had literal like lawn chairs in the waiting area. And they were like, yo, just sit in the chair and wait. And it was like a literal like go to Target and get the, the set of lawn chairs. And they looked like they had been out in a lawn before. And I was like, dude, I, I actually ended up getting a decent haircut from there, but I did not expect to. I walked in there, I saw those chairs and I was like, oh my gosh, like uh, this is probably not gonna be good. And if you think about like any restaurants you go to, you walk into a restaurant and like, the booth has tears in it and stuff. Like you're probably at a Denny's or a Norm's at two in the morning and you're not expecting much. You're just expecting food. You're, you're just expecting the basics. Like, okay, give me a haircut. But I've walked into other salons where just looking around, I'm like, oh, I don't know if I can afford this. And, and then when I find out I can actually afford it, I feel like I'm getting a great deal. I'm getting a more expensive feeling haircut than what I thought I could afford. So the third thing that we can offer our clients, aside from our skill and our hospitality, is our expertise. 
I don't even know if I spelled that right. I haven't like written in years and there's no spell correct or whatever on here. So if scale is how straight you can cut a line and hospitality is how you treat the client while you cut that line, then expertise is knowing exactly where to cut the line, exactly why to cut the line there, and exactly what's gonna to happen to that line from now until the next haircut when you come back. So expertise is, I've done enough haircuts long enough, I'm familiar enough with the trends, I, I, I know hair well enough that not only am I gonna cut a clean straight line, but it's gonna be so suitable for you because I've been doing this a long time. So expertise, I'll just say suitability. When I was going to school to cut hair, I remember meeting people at parties and such, and they're like, oh, you're going to school to cut hair? What should I do with mine? And they would show me their hair, and I'm like, bro, I like just started, I don't know yet. But when you've been cutting hair five years, 10 years, 15 years, you look around the room and you kind of have an idea of what everybody should be able to do with their hair. And there are customers who are like, I don't give a damn what you think I should do with my hair, but there are other customers who want to go to you because you've been cutting hair for 15 years and they wanna know what you think they should do with their hair. So to some customers, they don't value that, the, your personal taste, uh, I guess that would fall under personal taste more so. Somewhere between personal taste and suitability, I guess is what I'm ranting about right now. But I'll, I'll tell you a stupid story here. Uh, years ago, I got my bathroom remodeled and I wanted a bunch of weird specific things. I was like, dude, we're doing it all up. Let's go full custom. I want this weird stuff, whatever. And my contractor told me no. He's like, no, we're not going to do this, this or that like you want to do. And I was like, well, why not? And then he kind of went <sighs> and he pulled out a piece of paper and he drew my beams and he told me this shelf wouldn't fit this way and I would have to do that and it would cost me more. He talked me out of what I thought I wanted and talked me into what I'm very, very happy with now. And after everything was said and done, I was so happy that that guy had the expertise to give me something more suitable based on his personal tastes. He could, because he'd been doing that for so many years. And so many hair cutters are afraid to do that because they think it's ego or they think it's rude, but there are customers out there who, the ones who want expensive haircuts or want what an expensive haircut can more or less offer, they want that sort of thing. They want the opinions. They want you to use your expertise to help them find something suitable. And they want to know about your personal taste because you've been doing this long enough that your opinions aren't just opinions, but they're expert opinions. Another part of our expertise is product knowledge or styling knowledge. I guess those both are kind of related. A friend of mine who cuts hair in New York, Mari DeMonte, she said, she told me this one time and I was like, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. But she was saying that when she gets a new client in the chair after the first appointment, she gives them her card with her phone number on it. And she says, I'm your Google now. If you have any questions about your hair or products or anything else, you don't Google it. I'm your Google. And I was like, that's smart. I'm stealing that. And I have stolen that. I tell my clients, if you have any, any just message me on Instagram or text me or whatever. I want to, like, if you're in a grocery store and you're not sure which product is going to work, of course, the best product is my product, the one I'm using on you. But um, if you have any questions about your hair, product knowledge or styling information or anything, I'm your Google now. You're, you're paying me for your haircut. You can reach out and say, hey, I'm styling my hair and this thing, weird thing's happening here. What can I do? Uh, so like styling information, product information, that is a part of our expertise that we can offer, but not every barber offers. So believe it or not, this was actually the kind of short condensed version of this lecture. I used to do this similar kind of chart here where I would fill out a 45 minute space at, at trade shows and seminars and things. But this was like the condensed version. And the point I want to make with all of this is, look, if you're going to go spend 15, 20 bucks on a haircut, at the very least, your expectations are probably you want some skill in a haircut, right? But if we're talking about a hundred dollar haircut here, you probably, you either don't know what your ex expectations would be for $100. Like, what the heck do you even get for $100? This, in most cases, the, at least in my case, I think about all of this. And looking at other expensive hair cutters I know, they are dang sure of all this too. Like, none of it happens by accident. And so, like, all day long on Instagram, when, when I'm looking at other barbers, and I would imagine other barbers are just judging each other's cuts. I'm looking at the decor in the background. I'm looking at the way that they write. I'm looking at the way that they communicate to their, to their clients and what they're putting out. And it's like such a, the value of a haircut is so much bigger than the skill in the cut. I forget what year this was, but a number of years ago, 
Sports Clips was the fastest growing salon chain at the time. And I remember reading their mission statement at that time and, and going, yep, dang right. Because in their mission statement, and I'm, I'll look it up and if I can find it, I'll put it on the screen here, but paraphrased, it said something about reinventing the haircut experience. It didn't say anything about doing a better haircut. It didn't say anything about reinventing the haircut. It was all about the experience of the haircut. And by doing that, they were at the time the fastest growing haircutting chain in the world. Because I think subconsciously, every client kind of wants all of this, but consciously, they know they want this. And so the barber who is only conscious about this as well is gonna have a hard time being worth more than just this. But I'll tell you this, for $15, in probably any town, you can get a perfect fade. You can get a technically perfect fade for about 15 bucks. So if you're a hair cutter and you want to be worth more than just this, you have to consider all of this other stuff and think about how you want to construct it and build it and, and gear it and aim it toward your customer. Here's an interesting little bonus point that I noticed. Um, I used to kind of have a lot of beef with YouTube and I hated YouTube and I didn't want to do it for the longest time and like YouTubers kind of were cringy to me. But I realized after I came up with this a long time ago that there's this sort of line roughly here where everything below this line, you can more or less get through a screen and everything above this line, you can only get in person. I would say more often than I see a barber or stylist offering everything, I see a barber or stylist who's really good with their skill and really smart about their hospitality, but not really being egotistical enough to put their expertise out there and say, here's what I think and here's what I think looks good. They're afraid to do that. So I see these two being hit a lot more often than I see all three being considered by barbers and stylists. And then I also see obviously barbers and stylists who only think about the skill and they're not thinking about their hospitality. But I think what, what has happened is there's a majority of the hair industry who is focused on this, of course, everybody is focused on this. Some people also focus on this. And because so few people focus on this, there's this blue line here where under this line, you can get this stuff. Like if you go watch Bloom on, on, on YouTube, he offers advice on style and how to, how to use products. And, and here's what my personal tastes are. All of these things you can get from a YouTuber and there are YouTubers who have millions of subscribers offering this stuff because there's so many cheap mindset barbers out there who are not offering it. I thought that was kind of an interesting thing when I noticed it. I, I do believe that, the, um, not to knock YouTubers because, hey, I'm trying to be one of them, I guess, in some sort of way. We wouldn't see so much success on YouTube with this sort of thing if every barber was considering all of this stuff. And I can tell you again from my experience, when I look at barbers and stylists that I know who are charging a hundred plus dollars, they know all about this. They're thinking about all of this. They're not afraid to do this. They're, they've thought about doing this better than anybody they know. And when I meet barbers who are like, I charge 20 bucks and I'm trying to figure out how to get to like that 24 mark. Can you give me a hand? I'm like, well, and I start talking to them and this is the only thing they're thinking about. And that's why they're charging $20 and worrying about how to get to 24. You got to consider the bigger picture. Anyways, I know that was long-winded, but it was um, a lot of fun for me to make it. Uh, I appreciate you watching. Thanks.